It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only Chris Brogan, and we're going to be discussing the 10th anniversary edition of his and Julian Smith's best-selling book, Trust Agents, Using the Web to Build Influence, Improve Reputation, and Earn Trust. Chris, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Sean. I'm so excited to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, and, and uh, we were talking a little bit before we got into the interview that it is just an, an interesting season to me because like, I've been following your career for many years and I've gotten to talk to people like Chris Raven, Cliff Ravenscraft and now yourself and others, people who I wouldn't say I idolized, but I looked up to you and I admired your work early on. So it's fun for me to finally be able to sit down uh, and have this conversation. However, I know my audience, you know, there's, there's going to be some guy out there who's like, I have no idea who this Chris Brogan guy even is. So let's kick off our conversation by having you share a bit of the Chris Brogan origin story. Tell us about your superpowers, your special abilities. What do we need to know about you? I have no idea who I am. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> a, I think that's a good way to start every morning is not really be somebody. Um, you know, my, my background, I mean, way before I did any weird things, I was in telecom and wireless telecom, and I was just a regular guy at a regular cubicle. Um, with very irregular ideas. Now, I started blogging way back in 1998. They were calling it journaling then. Um, my first podcast was in 2005. My first internet video show was 2005. So I was a little early to a lot of games. But, I, you know, that wasn't like I was trying to get a trophy for that. I just saw something that some people didn't get right away. And I used Twitter early on. I was user 10,212 on Twitter. And I just could really tell there was a magic in that old silk hat. And I just would tell people that and they would just every single time be like, you're the dumbest. Like, that's, this is not an interesting toy. I mean, it's only 140 characters. And they'd complain. And then, of course, now we, you know, if you watch any news show or any sports show, you see tweets up on any screen all the time, every time. Almost a little too much, definitely a little too much. Um, and so what have I done? My, my job, I mean, I've written books. Um, I, had a, I had a pretty good blog for a while. And uh, now nobody reads blogs. So it's still a pretty good blog. There's just no one there. Um, and I got the chance to write a book um, early 2008 or so. I got a deal and I called my friend Julian Smith and said, hey, you want to write a book? And he was like, oh, okay. And that was really like, that's how we did it. And I said, okay, well, you write half hour, half. He goes, okay, great. I said, so we'd every day we'd sit down and uh, check on, you know, uh, message each other back and forth on text. And I'd write 2,500 words. He'd write 2,500 words. More often than not back then, I was getting uh, speeches and things like that. And so I would be late handing in mine. So he'd have to yell at me. Um, and so we wrote a book together. It came out. And so Trust Agents was the first thing I ever published in mainstream. And when I say accidentally, I'm not being humble. I, we don't know how it worked, but we hit the New York Times bestseller list, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Amazon, 800 CEO Read, Inc. Magazine, and I forget one or two. We hit all the awards. So I called him up and I said, well, that wasn't that hard. He goes, I know. And that was it, Sean. <laughs> so, by the way, I've hit none of those awards for the subsequent eight books, and I probably never will see one again. But, uh, you know, your first book, you do it like that, and you're like, well, I guess I'm done. Uh, that's how that went. And then since then, I've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world, Google, Microsoft, Coke, Pepsi, Titleist, Comcast, Sony, all kinds of nice big names. Uh, talked to a princess one time, got to be on the Dr. Phil show for who knows why. And uh, interview guys like Richard Branson and uh, Paulo Coelho. So, you know, not a bad gig, but I'm just a regular old guy, just like anybody else in the audience. I, I, you know, I pay someone to put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. And I, I, I'm just here. And uh, I'm also on the back end of my career. You know, I'm in the back 40 now. I've got white in my face, so I clearly don't know anything anymore. Uh, you know, we're the only culture in the entire globe that looks at white hair and says, oh, that guy doesn't know anything. Every other culture says elders. We say old people. So that's where I am, Sean. I'm back at your door. I'm here with you. Oh, man. That, that's a fun origin story. Um, you know, I, I, it's kind of funny. You only have to, hit the, have to hit the New York Times bestseller list once. And then forever, you're a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, author. There's a lot of magic and secret sauce that goes into hitting it. I think it's more complicated these days, partly just because we're over-publishing. There's so many books um, going into the market right now. Uh, I'm curious, though, in terms of how you saw yourself. Like, I, I come from a tech, a software background. You talk about starting out in telecom. Like, what was your evolution? When did you go, gosh, I'm no longer Chris the telecom guy. I'm a, an influencer. I'm an, an expert. Because I think a lot of people say, oh, Chris Brogan, he's he's a, a marketer, an expert, an influencer. They would probably put a lot of labels on you. But like you said, you're like, hey, I'm just a normal guy doing normal things. 
Um, for you, how did you uh, balance kind of riding the wave of people seeing you as one thing, but also kind of trying to stay true to how you saw yourself? It would be a pure lie to say that I never got big, too big for my britches. Um, in that sort of arc of things, people started taking, paying attention to me about 2007, I guess, where, you know, so, well, 2005, I guess, um, link, uh, uh, lifehack.org, which was, there's lifehacker, which is the one everyone knew. And there was lifehack.org, which was like the is Pepsi okay of like productivity blogs. And I got kind of popular over there. And then people started coming over to my site from that site. And that was the first wave of people like knowing who I was. And I started professional speaking. So I started getting invited to places. Uh, and that's like 2007. So then people started knowing who I was. And people would be like, oh, that guy who did that thing. In 2006, I in- launched an international event called PodCamp, which is about podcasting. And so that was 06, you know, so nobody was like all that into podcasting back then except weirdos. And that's who I wanted. And so, you know, I was a little big for my britches because we had this international event. And what we, when I say that, what I said was we launched the event that we said anyone could run one. Here's the six rules. And now there's seven rules because we had to change one. Uh, go make your own, make your own event. We'll, we'll, we'll come to as many of them as we can. And that's how we did it. So I got international awareness kind of quick. Um, and my big for my britches phase is somewhere between 2009, 2010. 2010, I was doing so much professional speaking. I was speaking approximately every three calendar days. I did 106 speeches, all paid. Um, that's a lot of work, a good bit of money, and not really sustainable for someone's living. Um, and, and so I, I want to say all that kind of grandiose stuff to say that, you know, I still don't believe my own hype. I mean, probably around 2009, 2010, I was probably a little too precious. But then beyond that, you know, I, for a very long time, my business card has just read typist um, because I think that people put up these crazy old titles for themselves. I'm technically the CEO of an S corporation, owner media, uh, owner media group, uh, which spells out OMG. And uh, someone said that to me one time. Do you know the initials of your company or <laughs> OMG? I said, yeah. Do you know that's blasphemous to some? I said, I know. Uh, and so that was, I, I just figured that God is not up there looking down at me going, well, I don't like your company name, sir. I'm pretty sure that's not, it's not high on his list. Um, and then I run another company called Chris Brogan Media where I'm uh, legally the president of Chris Brogan Media, but it's me and my underpants running the show. So it's not, you know what I mean? I'm not fussy sean because i i still can walk into uh, any starbucks anywhere on the planet and no one's going to say oh my gosh it's chris brogan there was a time there was a time when i showed up anywhere near a social media event and everybody would know who i was at a distance but i'm not that i'm not that fancy and i think it's i didn't ever need to be that fancy one of the things that people listening to this show are thinking sean is i've got to be x to get what I need. And well, I'm never going to be there because I'm not as important as somebody. Nobody's important until they are. And it doesn't matter. And they only get there usually in their own steam. Tim Ferriss is a huge deal because Tim Ferriss did the work to be a huge deal. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk was an immigrant trying to help his family sell more wine, period. Have a nice day. He worked harder than anybody still worked harder than me. I, th- I, th- I think I sleep less than he does, even if I sleep 10 hours a day, because he must just do it better. Like his 30 minutes of sleep is like five hours worth of mine. So Sean, that's how I feel. I feel that um, it's so important that you try to remove excuses from your life. And one of the big excuses is you got to be somebody. I'm still just a big dopey nobody. And I, I still get the great opportunities to spend time with people who I care about who matter to me. Well, I'm thinking back to, to 2006. That was so early for podcasting. Um, I started out podcasting uh, specifically in the Christian publishing space that I still work in today. Back in 2013, I remember going to a trade show as a podcaster, and it was focused on uh, radio and TV in the Christian media space. And I did like 18 interviews during that event. And literally all 18 of the authors were like, what's a podcast? So even, like, even in 2013, you know, it feels funny to look back you know, seven years later, but people had no idea what podcasting was even seven years ago. And now it's just, it's everywhere. And so uh, it's it's just funny to think how little penetration there was for podcasting in the market back in 06, even in 2013. And we're definitely in a different space today. Um, one more kind of sort of origin story question. I'm curious, you know, if you contrast where you were kind of where you were uh, just spending a lot of time sucking the air out of the balloon, thinking you were a big deal versus now, like who were you looking to for like insight and influence in your life, maybe at that stage of your career? Versus, versus where you are at now? Who are the people who've kind of spoken to you in different phases of your journey? 
I love that question so very much. At the very top of my game, I had to I had to seek out different kinds of mentors because what what really happens so all all success in life and, and remember we we all get to define success our own way. Um, all success in life is is kind of a hinge around the concept of opportunity, right? Do I or don't I have opportunities? Think about when you're at your worst, like say financially. When you're at worst financially, you got to go to your dumb job. You got to work your dumb hours. You got to do whatever the boss says because if you mess up, then you're out of your money and you need the money because you got to pay the rent or whatever you got to do. The one thing I always like to tell people is you've got a lot further to fall than you think you do. Like if you've got a, pl- a roof over your head, you're already way up on anybody else. You got water that you can drink. If there's no one shooting at you every day, you've got a lot of things over you that you know others don't. So one, think that. Two is you know when you get to some kind of to, to some great height, so to speak you get massive opportunities. So when I was the Chris Brogan, uh, you, every day, hey, you want to make a reality show? I talked to three different Hollywood people that wanted me to do a reality show. And I, I, was, I was as attracted to that idea as you could ever imagine. You know, me on a TV show? <laughs> and then I thought, how awful would that be to have a whole camera crew walking around, you know, recording every fart? You know, I mean, let's, let's be crass about it. They got all the things, every time you pick your nose is on someone's film now. And I, and, I, and I just couldn't see a value beyond my ego to that one. I, I, and look, I'm not, there's zero saintly in my body. There's nothing saintly about me. Quite, quite the opposite. Uh, but I would say that I could smell really early that it, the thing that matters the most to me in life is service. I think if we can't be a service to somebody else in some way, if what we're doing, my, my, my biggest advice I've given straight since 2006 is be helpful. Be the verb, do it, you know, helpful. That is the only lens you need to get a lot further ahead. And it wouldn't be helpful for all the opportunities I got. So when I, you asked the question, who are my influences? When I was super fancy, I needed bigger names to tell me, how do you say no to a whole lot of stuff? One problem I had, and, and I think a lot of people have this, is you never want to be seen to look like super high and mighty and above everybody. So you want to address everybody. You want to pay attention. You want to give everybody your time. And you want to make sure you never seem like a jerk. Well, I felt like saying no to people was a jerk. But they'd be like, can you be on my show? And I'd be like, well, I already got 14 shows scheduled today. How am I going to say yes to this person? Oh, they're going to think I'm a jerk. And I would squeeze in a 15th. Well, that came out of time for sleep. That came out of time for eating. And as fat as I am, I was, you know, I, I sure would like a chance to eat. And it mostly in 2009, 10 was coming out of my family, you know, and Oddly, you can take some, you can make some withdrawals on your family and you can make some more withdrawals on your family, but that bank account can go into negatives and then you can be in a real rough spot and you might have your bank account doing fine, but your family account, not so good. And I I hit that. I hit that in 2010 by saying yes to everybody. So the kind of advice I needed back then was from there. Where I draw my advice now, well, I run, I run a, a daily video show called The Backpack Show, and it's it's a business show ostensibly where we look for really unique guests to tell us interesting things. So we had a nun, we had Sister Ann Flanagan on. Uh, today we had a country music star. Um, we had a guy yesterday who had to escape the wars in Somalia uh, with his life, looking down barrels of guns and all that sort of thing, who had always dreamed to come into America. And so his book, this, this great memoir, was called Call Me American, because they used to all call him the American when he was living in Somalia. And by the way, it was dangerous times for him to do that because there were people with machetes and guns who didn't like this country uh, asking him some pretty important questions about why do you like America so much? And you'd have to learn how to talk about that. He is a place where I can get some of my advice. He's a place where I can learn from right now because to be of service, you really just have to keep looking through that lens over and over again of what can I pick up here and how can I share it there? Who needs to hear what's going on? And the thing I do and, and have done for I don't know how many years uh, is really try over and over again in different ways with different tools to say, somebody needs what you know. And my job is to help you feel confident enough to do that and give you some of the tools you need to get it out there so that people can hear and understand what you have to say to them. I, I, I like that, uh, the what you said earlier about uh, looking to the gray-haired folks, uh, you know, I, I think we look at the season we've gone through in 2020, whether we're talking about out in broad culture, even in the church, trying to figure out how to deal with things. Um, one of the things that's concerned me the most in this season is I see a, a lot of folks, I'm, I'm a, a Gen Xer, I've got lots of millennial friends, and a lot of times people are just looking in their circle in their same age group, like, how do we deal with this? How do we move forward? And a lot of times, if you're only looking for people kind of in your peer groups, 
that you don't always get that wisdom, those hard fought kind of battle scar lessons that people who uh, have seen some of the things we're facing right now, they, they went through the 60s and the 70s and have faced very difficult times culturally, politically, difficulties in the church. And so um, there is a lot of wisdom in seeking out older people who've been through the ringer and who can uh, tell you all the things that you don't know. Uh, I, I felt like until I got in my 40s, I really didn't know a whole lot. I feel like when you, when you creep into your early 40s, you've had enough experience and you have a little bit of wisdom, so you can start making some pretty solid decisions. But man, those people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, they've got a lot to say and a lot that we can learn from. So uh, I, I love that advice. Um, let's, uh, let's transition now, I guess, into the book, because that's what we're here to talk about today. Sure. Um, you know, as, as a guy who works in the publishing space, I know, you know, as a publisher, when we have a book that did really well, you know, every five or 10 years, like, hey, we need a new edition of that book because we want to keep that uh, thing chugging on down the line. And so, uh, you know, I get technology changes and things update. So obviously for a book like this, just because the environment in your book is being applied and that's changed. So uh, obviously you need to make some shifts there, but I'm curious for you, for Julian to be able to visit this message again for what I'm thinking is, is it the third time? Like what was in it for you? What were you hoping to be able to accomplish? Because it's, it's actually pretty rare for an author to get to come back to an, a message twice, let alone three or four times. So what were you and Julian hoping to get out of coming back to this yet again? I know some folks are are getting the audio version of this, but if you see me making a dopey face right now, (laughs) it's, you know, all right. I got to tell you something about me that, you know, you know, no one ever would lead with this, but I'm really dumb. Like I really am dumb. I make so many mistakes. I have so many failures and, and that's how I learn the best is I learn from failing. And, my old friend Christopher Penn, who started PodCamp with me, his joke has been since 2007, we take Chris Brogan everywhere twice. The second time is to apologize. And so I launched this book with Julian Smith. And then, yeah, we had a little bit of an update we were asked to give a couple years in, which makes sense. The book had done so well. We sold so much. They said, you ought to update it just a little. We wanted to squeeze that tea bag and get half a cup more tea out of that. Ten years in, Sean, this is a stupid idea. And I send a message. They didn't send me a message. I sent a message. And I'll tell you why. I was working on my 10th book. I had thrown away seven versions of my 10th book and thrown away 100 plus pages. This is going to be the worst name drop. But Seth Godin, I told Seth Godin, I keep just throwing away 100 pages at a time. And he said, you're a big, stupid idiot. He said nicer words. But he said, you're a big, stupid idiot. You could do something with those pages. And I said, well, I guess, but it's not the right book. And he's like, Ugh. like, fooey to you. So, in my desperation and in my sorrow, I said, well, you know, trust agents is coming up on 10 years. Maybe we should make another one. And I, the publishers, you know, it's middle of COVID or something there. I don't know. It was actually before COVID publishers are in a weak moment. They're feeling sad. They're singing. You don't bring me flowers. And they say, okay, fine. You can rewrite your book a little more broken. I'm like, thank goodness. And then uh, Julian and I uh, do what every author does and procrastinate like a good few months that could have like been useful. Uh, and then we really open up old trust agents and look. Number one, do not write a book with any words of technology in it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It looked like, you know, if like just to make it to anybody's thoughts, I'm in there saying, you know, tape cassette machines are great and you really ought to think about using tape machines. And I'm like, oh, nobody uses tapes anymore, right? Like that's what, that's the analogy. I was saying it about XYZ software company or, you know, tech people will know how to get on the front page of Dig which has been gone since like 07 or something. So that was the worst. And then we had all these people who worked at all these places that we called out because we love mentioning people we like and our friends that we knew from the years. And they all had different jobs. So I had to go in and write like formally or old guy or that's what they used to do 106 times. And by the end of even that, like they haven't even talked about what's changed. We're just like fixing the past. I was like, this is a stupid idea, Brogan. What do you do this for? You could be just, in your underpants eating mac and cheese or something you you didn't have to do this then we finally get to talk about what's changed in the world 10 years out from how people can use the web to build trust this is the time of deep fakes fake news um disagreements with with quote unquote facts uh truth ability and these kinds of things and, and and the, the most intense political environment in the world, at least in the United States, but in the world as well. This is a real tough time to talk about things we talk about 
with regards to trust. Trust is the core of this book. The reason we got a big bestseller was this thing accidentally hit right as the financial crisis in America hit. So people like at a a bookstore somewhere went, oh, that's weird. All the banks just closed. Trust. We'll look at this book on trust. They they didn't even know what they bought. That's why it's called a New York Times bestseller, not like a New York Times pretty good book. Not that good a book for what they thought they were buying. What we did in rewriting this book, Sean, was we, we, we addressed some of that. We said there, it, we're in an unprecedented time. This is a rough time. But we also, I mean, my gosh, I could rewrite it again next week because of all this stuff that happened with COVID. Um, as we recorded this, there's an argument about would, you know, presidential candidates do a virtual debate as we're recording this. And one saying, definitely not. And I'm thinking, how many, what, a, what percentage of people right now are forced to work over a screen right now and look at each other through a computer lens? And trust is different in that environment as well. People can feel really uncomfortable. I interviewed Richard Branson years ago for a cover article on Success Magazine. I was so beside myself. He's my business idol. And he, we're on Skype. He'd never used Skype. This is a man who has over 400 companies and is planning to go to the moon, has done way more daring things than you and I will ever do in our life. Uh, and he was a little nervous being on Skype because he didn't know me. And he was just like, what are you going to do with this video? And I can't, he was just look cagey a bit. And so think about how the world's changed. And I just think that there's so many more ways to think about that. And I know that's the longest answer you ever got to a simple question. But it all relates. It all relates because I think, Sean, one, don't ever rewrite your books. It's a stupid idea. Just go write another book. But But two... Uh, the world has changed and is changing faster than ever. And, and you could say that 60 years ago, you could say 200 years ago, but boy, the velocity now. Six months to now is two different planets. So I think there's a big future ahead in this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of 2020, we've never seen such a level of change. Like every every like 45 minutes, we have to go, what, what, what? There's always something different going on. Um, I guess next I'd like to have you maybe give us a working definition of what it means to be a trust agent, but maybe through the lens of, you know, I I think of when you wrote the original edition 10 years ago and what it meant to be online, what we were pitching, selling, interacting, being in community with others online, what it meant then. Um, But now in terms of being a trust agent, you know, I'm being a trust agent to some degree influencing what my mom is seeing on social media, what right. what people are thinking about what I do for a living. I'm portraying that in terms of my work with publishing and authors. I'm sharing things about my family. I might be a, an affiliate or have stuff that's sponsored. So I'm trying to get you to buy stuff and click on stuff. Um, so I, I feel like for just the individual, how we're operating to try to influence and be a trust agent. If, if we look back to 10 years ago, it meant one thing then it means something completely different now. So I guess if you had to apply it to the now lens, what does it mean to be a trust agent in this season? <clears throat> Excuse me. So with every, trust is trust is trust, number one. So, so the concept of trust is one thing. How one earns trust has changed dramatically. There's something I heard once, you know, if you never left the US, like if you ever only have been around like where you were born and raised and all that sort of thing, International travel opens your brain up in a big way if you get to talk to the people who are there. Seeing stuff, I, I, I've never once seen a new building and walked away and said, oh, now my life's different. But when you get a chance to talk to someone, what they say about Americans is that we're kind of, I don't remember what fruit they use. I'll use avocado because it's easy. We are so squishy. Like we'll tell you all kinds of stuff about us, but there's this core that you can never get into, like an avocado, right? And that thing is hard as stone and you're going to have to really fight to get the real, real, real Sean. Uh, and and that's how uh, other countries view Americans. Now, what they say about them is that they're more like a pineapple or they're more like a coconut or something. So the outside is really hard. So we're not going to let you even in the front. So we look arrogant or mad or anything we look like. But once you're in, you are way in. And everything after that border is soft and we'll give you everything. And we'll share absolutely the guts of who we are. Well, trust works like that, right? So with the book Trust Agents and a few subsequent books I've written, We steal uh, from this great book called Trusted Advisors, Charlie Green and David Meister, who are friends. uh, We stole their equation because they wrote the best equation in the world for trust. And what goes into that is, uh, and I'm I'm blanking on the the actual equation, but the the things I'll say is that it's, it's basically, you know, are you relatable? Are you likable? Do people, you know, is there truthfulness in what they're hearing from you that at least in their perception divided by self-interest the part that's the most important to our story 
is divided by self-interest, meaning what's in it for you negates a massive amount of what you talked about. We've all met that person. We've all met that person that seems really nice because they want something from you. That's in every industry in the world, right? So one thing about trust is that it's all about what I said at the beginning, being of service, being someone who gives. We don't feel comfy if we don't quite understand the, the scenario. Like imagine getting invited over to somebody's house and you're eating their food and you're at their dinner table and all that. You're eating their food and then they present you with a check at the end. You'd be like, what? Sorry? Oh, this is a rest. I didn't even understand this is a restaurant, right? So if that mindset comes to mind, like you just don't understand that transaction, trust is about that. Trust is about understanding where we stand, where we are, who we are. So when we wrote Trust Agents, the part that's non-malleable is that we think it's really important that businesses and organizations, including religious organizations and everybody, pay strong attention to establishing relationships where people can see and understand uh, as honest a picture as we can ever paint of each other so that they understand what they can expect or not expect from those interactions. Uh, if you're, <laughs> one example is that right now during the, the, the pandemic, certain religious entities are saying, uh, come to our building, you need to be here and commune in person. And partly if you were a very angry, cynical person, you could say that's because you need to hand the money over to little plates and I need you in this room to do that because we don't get as much money if you try to send it in through an envelope. That's me being harsh. But I'm going to say it for that reason because I want you to think about the fact that there's tons of ways to get a little money handed over if that's really important to your church. And it is, right? We can't do anything without money. It's really silly to, to, to well, why does the church want to do collections anyway? Because you can't. You can't help anybody. You can't build a bridge. You can't make uh, food for the poor. You can't do any of these things without it. But again, you know how to earn that trust? Just say, look, I know it's hard to come in. I know we got to do the social distancing thing. I know this means something different in our religion. Than, you know, but wherever two or more are gathered, there was no stipulation. There was no like you got to be you know, six feet apart. And they didn't have Zoom when they wrote the Bible. So you can, you can gather in Zoom. It's fine. It's going to be fine. And I think that trust and, 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 and generating trust and all that, and to be a trust agent is to be able to communicate clearly. And I have a formula that I use all the time, real simple one, content, community, and marketplace. And you almost kind of look at them as rings. Content is that campfire that we all gather around. You ever been out in front of a real campfire? The fire's going, so we all just kind of quiet, and we all just watch the fire burn for a while, and we, we say a little bit of BS or something like that. And then community happens when someone says something that's a little bit over, you know, a little bit more vulnerable. Like, you know, I, I can't tell my family this, but I'm really worried about where that next month's rent's coming from. And I'm not feeling good about that. That's community, right? Because you've just opened a vulnerable spot in you to a circle. And that circle has the opportunity to, to really hurt you or say, yeah, I know just what you mean. You know, I've, I've been kind of thinking about Kansas SpaghettiOs right now because I don't really have the money for steak. And, and, and so that's community. Well, and then the third one is a business element of it, which is marketplace. And marketplace around friends is a really different thing. Our marketplace around friends is we give of each other. You know, I'm going to get that deck built. So I'm going to have my buddy come over and help me build this deck because that's what we do. Or, you know, our families are looking to clean out the attic a little bit. We got a whole bunch of clothes. We're going to all put them up in a couple of trucks and get them down to the Goodwill or wherever we got to take them. So content, community, and marketplace is how I show businesses what to do. That if you make interesting content that draws people's attention in as good as a campfire would, then you have the opportunity to earn the right and sell and serve, which is the community. And then the marketplace are there products or services that the kind of people you've gathered around have any value to use, right? So, so that's how I, I teach every business in the world to do it. And, and trust is basically kind of the table stakes to even show up at this. If I show up to your concert, you know, you're, you're doing some rock concert or something like that. It's like one of the coolest Christian rock bands in the world. And I show up with t-shirts, but you could tell I don't know anything about the band. I'm not, I'm not even a Christian or whatever. When you're like, eh, I don't really feel like giving you my money because, you know, I'd rather support the people who are here and have been part of it. That's what we do. To me, you know, like for instance, when I talk about my show, I never, ever, ever say the word audience. I say community because to me, the big difference between audience and community is which way you put the chairs. And community is about, can I get more people threaded? And look at all the people you've had on the show, so many episodes, and they start to know each other. And the people paying attention to you start to know names that they hear repeated a few times. 
that's where trust comes from. Trust comes from starting to really, it's like, you know, good old Mr. Rogers a million years ago. It's the people, you know, in Sesame street and all that. It's the people that you meet in your neighborhood, right? It's Mr. Rogers neighborhood. There's that small home feeling is what's going to get us through the big new world that we're in. Yeah. People are definitely in a, a community vacuum right now. They're looking for places to connect and be in real relationship, not not fake, uh, fake relationships. We're just trying to sell them something. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one more question related to kind of being the face of an organization. You know, I, I think back in the day, uh, an organization could be sort of just nebulous and vague. You know, it's like, I, I am Delta Airlines. I am XYZ Publishing Company. And people were fine with relating to a brand as just, oh, that's the brand that I buy my whatever it is from. Uh, but now we're in a different season where the CEO and other executives are expected to be public faces. Uh, you know, the PR and marketing people are expected to be public faces. And, and not mm -hmm. only that, you know, our audiences, our communities, you know, the, the people we're doing business with, they expect us to be at least somewhat visible and accessible uh, in whatever form of social media they choose to try to interact with us. So, um, you know, if, if we look at it from more of an organizational perspective, is it still possible for a company to just be this kind of vague, nebulous organization? Or do you need real people to be the faces of the organization to make it more relatable? I think if you're selling anything any more complicated than a hot dog, um, you need some faces on the company. You know, I don't care who makes my hot dog. You know, if, if I get up to that counter and there's a nice person sticking those things with a fork into a bun and I feel like they got gloves on and everything looks clean enough, I'm going to eat that hot dog. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, but you know, we buy from people we like. That's number one. And the, the, the stats, I mean, so remember always that 54.6% of statistics are made up. But there's been surveys that say that, especially as we're getting a little younger and younger, so 30-something, 20-something, uh, and, and teens, where, where the money starts to get really interesting for most people. I like old people's money, but I'm a, I'm a weirdo. Um, we buy from people we feel like we align with their values. And that matters more and more and more. And look, look at the way the U.S. has gone the last bunch of months. Again, this is treading right near political waters, and I don't want to spook anybody off, but you know what? You're a religious publisher. You, you get used to that. You can, you can say strongly, this, you know, look at Chick-fil-A is one of the most successful fast food companies in the world right now. And they're outgunning some of the guys who have way bigger money. They're outgunning guys who have way bigger advertising. And they're doing it because they're a Christian company that has certain values that make a lot of people really happy. There's people who are anti because of their issues with certain parts of their communities that they believe in. That's always going to be in every religion One th and, and, and group and everything. Tribalism is not a bad thing. Tribalism is how the world has existed for eons. And that's, you know, behind some of the biggest wars that we still say we can't understand. Anytime someone says, I can't understand and war, it's almost always a tribe thing in some way. And that tribe, and I don't mean a specific race, gender, creed, or anything when I say that. For instance, Afghanistan was a big issue between city people and rural people. I just did a show this morning with a country music guy who, of course, ap appeals to a, a different kind of person. And my friend Becky, who does small town business stuff specifically small and rural and those small and rural are two four letter words when we talk the economy in this country so when we listen to these people uh you know in their political moments try to talk to us you know who they're not talking to they're not talking to small and rural they're not talking to mom and pop and again i'm just treading right on these edges of political but it's important to the to, to the question because people want to go where they feel like they belong and i think that it's important that we communicate that. When you say, can you put, you know, should we have faces on these businesses? Yeah, oh my gosh, Sean, we should absolutely have faces on these businesses. And we should be comfortable and confident in saying the things we stand for. We have to accept that some people are not going to put their money with us, just like we're not going to put our money with people that we think don't go against ours. What we always have to do, though, is as we're kind of getting in those fights, don't do it because of the shirt you're wearing. Don't do it because of the sticker on, you know, the back of your car or whatever. Do it based on, does this make sense to you? And do you feel this is, you know, if, if you're expressing your religious opinions, do those match what you think are the intention of, of the greater experience, not necessarily one particular building on one particular street corner? You always got to ask, you know, a little bit above the, the nearby church or whatever. You got to ask the question, does this match what you think the bigger intent of the, the word was supposed to be? And I think that's one kind of way to measure 
that gets you a little less in trouble. And, and then one last thing about it. I'm a big fan, and Stephen Covey said this uh, in, in his book, Seven Habits. He said in a live version of uh, talking about seven habits, he said he loves the word integrity, but he feels like most people get it wrong. People think of integrity as this kind of like uh, religious or uh, uh, moralistic term. He says it's not. It means if you're a real jerk, then just be a real jerk everywhere. Be integrated. Integrity means integrated. Be you at all of those places. Now, listen, we might cuss in some environments and not cuss in other environments. That's not a big deal. But if you're kind of a grumpy person, well, then just be grumpy. And if your business, you know, can sustain that, we want to buy from people that we feel are being who they really are and that we feel we connect with that. That's the thing. That's the hardest part, I think, Sean. I think it's hard to hide if you don't think you, if you think you don't like or that people won't like what you are and who you represent. But then that isn't a business problem anymore, is it? Right. Well, like one of the pieces I give authors uh, when they're first starting out is, you know, in terms of who you portray online, be yourself, you know, because people are going to expect you to be that person uh, when you're out speaking, when you're at conferences and events. They expect who they see on social media, on podcasts, on YouTube. They think that's who you really are. So if that's not you, you will eventually get to a really weird place where those two things come to a head and you're going to uh, have to deal with that and, and sort that out. Um, and the other thing I, I often will tell people, especially as they're starting to have uh, like a measurable level of success is don't ever forget where you came from. We all mm-hmm. started from nothing. And I even saw this um, in my tech career. I had really good success in some software companies in Minnesota back in the day. And even when I was managing large teams, I always tried to be able to still get down in the trenches with even the newest technician. I didn't need to know how they did their work, but I needed to, be, needed to always be mindful of what was it like to be that, that guy starting out when that extra bonus or that extra kindness or buying somebody dinner. When I was 22, that meant the world to me because somebody was showing me kindness and seeing me and relating to me. And so that's something I've tried to really maintain throughout my career. But that's something I really try to coach people as they're on their way up is don't forget where you came from because that's gonna, what's going to keep you human. It's going to keep you likable, relatable, and grounded. Because I, I think with even what you said earlier, when you get kind of too big for your britches, it's a rough place to figure out how to navigate because I think to some degree, you're not being who you are anymore. You're maybe trying, trying to be somebody else or trying to be something that other people seem to uh, want you to be. And that's only sustainable, only manageable for a short time. Um, let's jump quick into sort of a, uh, a marketing lens for, for 2020. I think in terms of messaging and uh, reaching out to our communities online, it's been a, a, a real difficult dance. You know, it's like what, what you put out yesterday may have been received well. And if you use that same message the next week, it's going to be tone deaf and you're going to look like an awful bunch of human beings. Um, any thoughts on, you know, companies, people who you've seen knock it out of the park or people who've kind of fallen off the cliff, who, who's done something really amazing or done something not so good in this season with messaging? You know, it's, uh, I, I can talk about this endlessly um, because I think, I think one thing is observing advertising and marketing is such an armchair sport, right? Like we all get stuck in our face with it all the time and we all know when it doesn't feel right. I'll give you an early, early example I saw that stuck out of my head, which was Lincoln, uh, uh, the car company. And, the, and they had this, uh, I think, I don't remember what platform I had to be using. It was like CBS uh, All Access or something. And they had you know, an ad that would run from the Lincoln company, Lincoln Motor Company. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And they, they were like, look, we get it, you're home. Your sanctuary is your home. It's really important. So we've just introduced a way that you just do all this online. We'll just drop the keys off with the car in the driveway. You have to sign one piece of paper. We're gone. You don't have to touch anything. You're good. And I liked it because it said, we're not trying to tell you how, what the mileage is or what kind of you know, financing you get on this car. We're just saying we get that you're feeling a little weirded out. But if you were needing a car right before this all got started, here's how you can get one. It's not going to be that scary. That's an important kind of messaging, right? That messaging says, here's how you work with us in this time. And here's how we're going to help you with that. I, th- so I have three-ish, maybe four, um, real simple things every single company has to pay attention to with regards to marketing right now. It is uh, simplicity, brevity, clarity, and what I'm calling labeling, labeling or packaging. So simplicity, be really like one thing at a time with people. You know, a lot of times people will send out something like an email newsletter and it'll have six different ideas or actions that people can take. Don't do it. One, one per. Uh, Brevity, be small. Like you can't tell that from my answers, but I'm here as an interview guest. I'm supposed to talk a lot. 
But if you ask me when I'm marketing to someone, I, my marketing letters are 300 words or less every time because we're almost all reading them on our mobile device, number one. No one sits down to their big 27-inch monitor to read your incredible you know, epiphany of an email. They're sitting on a toilet somewhere and they're in between two tasks or they're walking down a hallway or they just got the coffee in the kitchen and they're going back to their office before one of their kids asks them a math question they can't answer. So you got to be brief. You got to say it super small. Clarity, just be so clear about what you want. Like, you know, don't hint with anybody. You know how in mystery books you're supposed to misdirect people and you're supposed to, you think it's the butler, but all along it was the maid. And you're like, oh, I didn't know. Who has butlers? Um, We'd be crappy mystery writers if we were writing good good business marketing because we should start at the beginning. Butler did it. You lead up front with the really important stuff. Make the clarity, you know, I'm going to be asking you to come in and change your work hours with me. And that's the start of the letter. You know, look, you know what's going on. You know the time's going on. You know we're getting ready to have some layoffs. I really want to keep you on board, but I'm going to have to make some changes to our career and our working experience. See how that works? It's just got to be direct, direct, direct. And then the fourth one, I say labeling or packaging. If you're telling stories, I, so I, I, I do a lot with business storytelling. I do a lot to show people that stories are a great way to keep people remembering stuff. Uh, we can't remember numbers very well. We can't remember like rules very well. It's kind of like trying to eat soup with a pencil. But a story sticks to the ribs just like a good soup. Story, like I could, you'll remember something I said in this podcast that I just sort of threw at you because there was a story stuck to it. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that anyway. Um, so if you could tell stories, but the, the thing that's wrong or different now, and think of marketing as a story too, right? It's a story of what you do to make somebody's life better. You need to communicate in such a way that people understand your intent in that story. So you could tell a story about, you know, in this book, I write all about, let's talk about authors. You know, in this book, I write all about how, you know, the rough stuff that I dealt with in my childhood was terrible and I had to overcome a lot, but boy, I'm here now. Well, that, you just told the story, but you didn't say what I'm supposed to do with it. So in this book, what I want to help you with is I want to help you find the same kinds of tools as they apply to you, not me. I want, to, I want you to see your own journey the way I saw it. And I'm going to give you tools to kind of articulate that out, whatever you're selling. Make sure the labels explain what people are supposed to do with it. Think how many times you get sent something in the mail or how many times you've seen a product and, and, and you, well, what am I supposed to do with this is the question that comes to mind. You got to solve for that. So simplicity, brevity, clarity, and labels or packaging, whichever one. That's my big advice. Well, and I give that kind of advice to authors, you know, even if, whether it's in the Christian space or people who are writing other sorts of nonfiction, uh, you need to have stories, obviously, because that's what, what's, what's going to be portable. That's what people are going to, oh, I read this book. I, I don't remember this or that, but boy, they told this story and I really related to it. Or um, some kind of a catchy formula or something that can capture the whole like big idea from the book and something that I can just write out on a napkin or something really small. Um, have something that's portable and transferable because that's what people are going to use to do the book marketing for you. They'll use it to actually start telling other people uh, about your book. Um, one of the sections I really liked in the book is you talk about stuff we need to quit doing, stuff we should start doing. Um, and, and you don't even need to necessarily give us stuff that was specifically in the book. But even this week, I find myself just going through rhythms and going, oh, I got to do these things and just pumping out content and doing stuff because I'm used to doing it and scheduling things. Um, but I, at the same time, I know if I back up a little and go, oh, do I really need to do this? Is there something better I could be doing with our time? Because especially for those of us who started out blogging back in the day and all these different things, we have patterns and things that we're really comfortable with that we maybe like to do that we've always done. Yet the world has changed where people find and consume our information has changed. So uh, give us a couple of things we should throw away right now and a couple of things we need to really start picking up and investing in. So there's a, there's a paradox that I have to explain, which is that we are now a world of snacks all the time. And then you have to add the word until. Until is a magical word. I've talked about this I don't know how many times now because I'm super into the concept. But, you know, uh, you don't need a car until some teenager backing out on his first week having a car crushes yours to bits. Until, right? Um, I thought I was a pretty good Christian until uh, somebody knocked on my door at 1 a.m. and screamed, please let me in because there's a guy here and I think he's going to kill me, right? Boy, that's a whole different thing than what you just read in the Bible the last several years because now there's a person and now there's a real thing. And until that moment, I didn't know what I was going to do, right? Until is powerful. So let me give you my sentence again. We are, in, we are a world of snack consumers 
until we want to go deep. Now, one thing that marketers do wrong all the time is they have the mistake of thinking that everyone's just like them. So I have been preaching very short messages, very brief messages, small, simple stories over and over and over and over and over again. And every single time I do this, 100% guarantee, every single time, three to five newsletter responders will say to me, I love long form. And I always say the same thing back. That's awesome. I think spam tastes delicious and a lot of people don't, right? It's all good, what you love. But if you're, if you're selling to yourself, then you are absolutely right to take that into account. But what you got to ask your question is who's buying and how are they buying? So I even mean buying with attention. Facebook has at the very top of the Facebook now what? Stories. Instagram has what? At the very top, stories. LinkedIn just added what to the top of it? Stories. What are stories? What are, what are all those stupid circles doing? One, they're dumb. Of course they're dumb. Everyone thinks they're dumb. We're just doing it because someone made us do it. But why are we doing it? Because Snapchat came along and everyone went, oh my gosh. This is more brief, but it's not like Twitter. I don't even have to think of words. I can just take a picture of a cat. There it is. And it's gone, right? That's stories, right? So then uh, uh, TikTok comes, whether or not, you know, President Trump kicks it back out of the country again, we'll find out. I'm not a fan because it's I, just all that data going to China has me a little twitchy. And I'm sure there's some really great Chinese people. I just don't really want the government knowing what I did or didn't do on any given day. Um, but that's a storytelling platform, which got more people more excited, which made LinkedIn say, well, if Microsoft and Oracle and all these big corporations want to buy TikTok, we ought to put stories on it. Those are all snacks. What did I start my sentence with? Snacks. So Sean, uh, we all hold these little glass rectangles up and near us. People are maybe consuming this thing in this little glass rectangle. We keep these little chocolate bars right by our head like we're superheroes. We're brain surgeons and we're waiting for a call at 2.26 a.m. You know, that's how close they are to us. It's the first thing we reach for in the morning, unless we have glasses and we get the glasses so we can see the rectangle, right? That's what we do. So if that's the device, then if you're not engineering all of your communications and, com and conversations and everything to be snack size, to fit on one piece of that pane of glass, you're already blown it, right? If it takes a while to get to your point, you've blown it. That's why I put my point at the beginning of the story. I said, snack, snack, snack until longer. Because what do people want more than anything when they decide that people don't want to be sold to ever? No one ever wants to be sold to, but we love to buy. Sean, if you've decided this is your year to get that Harley Davidson, because you seem like a biker kind of guy to me when I look you over, I think that's your thing. When you say, this is it, I'm getting me a Harley Davidson, what do you do? You read all the articles you can. You can say, what's a first year Harley Davidson guy going to have to know about that I know I'm not going to know about because I've never had a motorcycle in my life. You know, you start really deep. And honey, you should read this article that says guys live longer if they have a Harley Davidson, right? You know, you bring all your proof, justification, little pants for your butt, you know, cover your butt. Um, and that's how information goes. So even as you know, you're in publishing, you know, you're selling a good couple hundred pages. If you're not selling this couple hundred pages such that you front end it so that people really know what's, what they're getting. And if you don't use them, their marketing tools to, to market that with small snacks, they don't know they want to get the big book. They don't know they want to get the big payload. So snack, snack, snack until long form. There you go. That's your formula. Nice. Well, and you know, for my, my author friends, you know, I, I know so many of you have blogs and you're still excited about that because you're a writer and Hey, if that gives you great joy, keep writing. I'm not going to take that away from you. But if, if you start digging into your analytics, looking at the analytics for your website, if you've got a YouTube channel, look at the analytics there and, and all the places you can get data where you're actually pushing content. I bet you would be astounded at how many people are consuming it on mobile. I mean, even like we pay attention to that stuff at our publishing company on a monthly basis. We're monitoring all that kind of data. And even from 12 months ago to now, the amount of traffic that is solely mobile, I mean, it is exponentially increasing at a rate I don't think we expected. Because, you know, I think as publishing people, we assume you might want longer form content. Um, and, and I liked what you said earlier in terms of really simplifying your newsletters. I mean, we've definitely found if we limit our newsletters to only maybe one or two things that somebody can actually do, accomplish, click on, uh, the actual click-through rate goes up hugely versus if we have like five things, it, it drops to almost nothing because we're making too many decisions that people have to deal with. And so, yeah, love, love those tips and tricks there. Um, one more question I want to ask uh, about the book before we wrap up. In terms of you know, you've had like an 11, well, probably more of a 12 or 13 year journey with trust agents from when you first started writing to now. Sure. Uh, but in terms of like predictions that you and Julian made, things that you thought you saw in the future, like what are the, the worst things you predicted that didn't come true? 
the worst things that didn't because we did well, really well. well or, or it could be thinking like as you look as you look back, if, if you and he get in a room, what makes you chuckle? Like, why did we say that? Oh my golly! There, you know, there, <laughs> there are nonstop things that we thought would you know. Have, we, we all think there should have already been a flying electric car by now, right? You know, we all should have personal jetpacks by now. But, you know, the, the, the kind of meme jokes about why we don't have jetpacks are because we have things like memes. You know, I didn't predict anything to do with kind of meme culture being a thing. I didn't predict that one of the fastest ways that people could absorb and reference lots of information were through stupid photo with a little bit of white and black text above and below it. And so my, I have a 14 year old son, 14 and a half. He's his uh, freshman year of high school. And when he was five or six years old, we're in a Walmart one time. And you know, that, that bin of doom uh, with the DVDs in it, you know, that $5 DVD bin that everybody likes to paw through for, you know, nothing to do with their life. And they're just like, it's like stirring a cauldron and you're looking and I, I always think to people, why would you do this? Like, this is so much time in your life that you're going to invest trying to find a movie. You probably don't want to watch cause it's $5 for that little gym. But we humans love that. My son, Harold, grabs the, the movie, he, five or six years old, he grabs the movie 300, which was about King Leonides and his battle against, uh, you know, Xerxes and all that. Bloody as anything kind of movie. Like, you wouldn't want to show a 12-year-old that movie. He holds this up and goes, I love this movie. And, like, five Walmart employees are looking right at me and looking at my little five or six-year-old kid. And I'm like, I'm going right. I'm getting arrested. I'm getting arrested in this store. He'd never seen 300. He saw some meme that uh, where Leonidas yells, this is Sparta. Someone turned it into a funny song. And he knew that. We never predicted memes. We never really predicted uh, what levels to which people would have to be even more media savvy. We say to people all the time in trust agents, you've got to learn how to be a media person even to speak it, but also to consume it. We're in a world right now where you can deep fake anything. And people are worried about you know, putting actors' faces on dirty movies and things like that. And that's, that's troubling. You don't want that because it wasn't you and you didn't commit to that. And it's, 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 it's a yucky thing to think about. But what I at least want is that to be the faces of politicians and people we're supposed to trust. And we can say, and we probably say every day, I saw that with my eyes. I saw the movie. I mean, you could, you could tell me that it didn't happen, but I just saw this video footage. Well, it's getting easier to fake this video footage. And you know, there might be a biblical reference to someone who doubted and some of the problems that caused a lot of people. Uh, maybe that would not be a good thing to really invest in, you know, into our moral fiber, into our cultural fiber. I think we have to have a little bit more trust, a little bit more faith. And uh, I think that that's the stuff we didn't predict. Hmm. Yes. And, and Lord only knows what's in the future. I'm, I'm excited and kind of cautious to see what's on the horizon in terms of news, fake news, and, and even what people are consuming, you know, uh, as a dad, I go and look at what's on YouTube and other places and look at what's trending. And, you know, so uh, partly so I can talk to my kids about it and the stuff that's trending, I'm not going to lie. I find a lot of it pretty disturbing. So especially the music, I'm like, I don't understand why anybody would, there's nothing really edifying or worthwhile about this, but so yeah, we're, we're definitely in, uh, some strange times. Uh, Chris, you've talked about, you've got a, a range of things that you're doing. You've got a podcast, uh, you've got other content than that you're producing. So, uh, if the people listening to this, watching this want to connect with you, you know, what, what's that thing that you're making or doing right now that you're most excited to have people connect with? Well, I guess probably the easiest to connect with is a little different than the one I'm most excited about. I do a little video show called the backpack show and it's every weekday, 10 AM Eastern. You can see it, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Uh, that's my favorite thing I do because I get to interview just such a variety of people. Like I said, we had a nun on and that was so fun. Sister Ann Flanagan, she was grand. She was one of our more uh, uh, appreciated guests that we had had. And we've had rock and rollers, you know, we've had, we've had movie actors and stuff like that. And people liked our nun. Uh, the other thing I do though, that I, I would really guide people towards is, you know, at chrisbrogan.com, you could just find my newsletter that comes out every Sunday. And the two reasons I recommend it isn't because every single issue is a winner. Some, sometimes nobody writes me back. But what's different than my newsletter and most anyone is when you sub to it, you can just hit reply. Anytime the letter comes in, you hit reply, it goes right to me. There's no, I don't pay anybody to read my news. I, oh, I'd be the worst. So, and I, I write back, you know, and everybody says something usually like, I can't believe you wrote me back. And I'm like, well, it'd be pretty dumb for me to talk about it all the time if I didn't do it. 
And that's why I say that, Sean. So go to chrisbrogan.com, find my newsletter. It's uh, chrisbrogan.com slash NL if you want to go right to the page. But it's, um, that's the best thing I do every week. And, and again, not because I write the best thing. It's because I get a chance to talk with you and that's the part that matters. Well, and like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Chris, pick up a copy of a book and connect with all the things Chris Brogan related. Uh, it's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbit Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Chris Brogan. Once again, our book today was Trust Agents, Using the Web to Build Influence, Improve Reputation, and Earn Trust. Again, for everything Chris Brogan related, go to his website, chrisbrogan.com. You can find it all there. And Chris, I just want to say thank you for sharing with us today. It's been a fun, it's been a whiny conversation. I appreciate you pouring into my community. It meant the world to me to be here with you, Sean. Thank you so much.